settle down and prepare ourselves. Wonderful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we are your most poor servants and are unworthy of all your good, but we ask you to increase within us the treasure of your knowledge so that we may love you. For we only wish to know you so that we may love you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Liberto to introduce our speaker. Actually, I'm going to give a little history of our lecture series, and Dr. Maloney will be introducing our speaker in a minute. In the spring of 2005, Notre Dame Seminary began the Aquinas Lecture Series. This public lecture was instituted in order to complement the Fall Lecture Series, which would eventually be named the Monsignor Terry Teacup Lecture Series, named in honor of a longtime faculty member who died suddenly in the summer of 2005. Where the Teacup Lecture Series is more general in scope, the Aquinas Lecture was intended to invite scholars whose work made important contributions in the fields of Thomistic theology or philosophy, or those whose work made critical and important use of the angelic doctor's thought. If we look at the teaching of the magisterium, it is clear that a lecture series dedicated to the thought of the angelic doctor is most fitting. From Pope Leo XIII's Eterni Patris to Pope John Paul II's Fides et Ratio, the magisterium has singled out the teaching of St. Thomas as a sure guide in pursuing truth. Listen to the words of Pope Leo XIII, who wrote so eloquently of the angelic doctor. And I quote, with his spirit at once humble and swift, his memory ready and tenacious, his life spotless throughout, a lover of truth for its own sake, richly endowed with human and divine science. Like the sun, he heated the world with the warmth of his virtues and filled it with the splendor of his teaching." End quote. With regard to seminary formation in particular, the Second Vatican Council was clear about the important role that St. Thomas's thought should play in the theological formation of seminarians. The decree on priestly training states, in order that they may illumine the mysteries of salvation as completely as possible, the students should learn to penetrate them more deeply with the help of speculation under the guidance of St. Thomas and to perceive their interconnections." End quote. At NDS, we take this charge very seriously. The Aquinas Lecture provides an important opportunity for promoting the thought of St. Thomas. Past speakers have included a who's who of Thomistic scholars, including such notables as Norris Clark, Benedict Ashley, Brian Davis, John Whipple, Stephen Long, Edward Fazer, and Lawrence Dewan to name a select few. With our present speaker, we continue our tradition of bringing the finest scholars to give this important lecture. Here to introduce our speaker tonight is Dr. Becky Maloney, Academic Dean and Director of Institutional Effectiveness. Thank you, Dr. Liberto. We're very happy to have Professor Russell Hittinger as our lecturer this evening. He held the William K. Warren Chair of Catholic Studies at the University of Tulsa from 1996 to 2019, concurrently serving as a research professor in the School of Law. He was made an Emeritus Professor of Religion there in May of 2019. Also in 2019, he became the Senior Fellow at the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago, where he's a visiting scholar in the John U. Neff Committee on Social Thought and visiting professor in the law school. 
since 2020. He is a visiting professor at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, which is part of the Graduate Theological Union, University of California, Berkeley, and has served as the Dean of College of Fellows since 2014. Starting in 2022, Professor Hittinger will take up residence at the Catholic University of America as a research professor. He has taught at Fordham University and at Catholic University of America, and has taught as a visiting professor at Princeton University, New York University, Providence College, and Charles University in Prague. During the academic term 2014-2015, he was a visiting ordinary professor in the School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America. In addition to these distinguished teaching posts, Professor Hittinger has been the recipient of various awards and honors. In January 2020, he was invited to give the Aquinas Lecture at Blackfriars, Blackfriars, Oxford, pardon me. Since, 20, since 2001, he has been a member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, to which he was elected a full member in 2004 and appointed to the governing board from 2006 to 2018. On September 8, 2009, Pope Benedict XVI appointed Professor Hittinger as an ordinarius in the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, in which he finished his tenure term in 2019. He received the Pontifical Medal Deo Scientarium Dominum. In 2005, he was made an Alonzo McDonald Senior Fellow for Christian Jurisprudence in the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University School of Law. He remains an affiliated scholar. On May 25, 2013, he was awarded a Doctor of Humane Letters by the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at the Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley, California. He gave the 81st Annual Commencement Address and was elected Dean of the College of Fellows in 2014. In 2003, to mark the centenary of the death of Pope Leo XIII, Professor Hittinger gave a lecture to the Ministry of Culture of the Italian government. In 2004, he gave Secularity and the Anthropological Problem, which was the inaugural Claude Ryan Lecture in Catholic Social Thought at McGill University in Montreal. In December 2006, he addressed the President, Prime Minister, and Speakers of the Polish Parliament in the Royal Castle in Warsaw. His keynote address culminated in a week-long celebration of human rights in the Polish Constitution. In 2000, he was a senior research fellow at the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture, where he's on the Board of Advisors. For the academic year 2007-2008, he was the Robert J. Randall Distinguished Visiting Professor in Christian Culture at Providence College. His books and articles have appeared on the University of Notre Dame Press, Oxford University Press, Columbia University Press, Fordham University Press, The Review of Metaphysic, Metaphysics, The Journal of Law and Religion, The Review of Politics, and several law journals, both American and European. He has publications forthcoming for Yale University Press and Catholic University of America Press. It is my great honor to introduce our presenter for this year's Aquinas Lecture, Dr. Russell Hittinger. I wear this hat is to keep my head warm so I can give this talk. But I will take it off at the time. <laughs> Not that cognition completely depends upon flesh and blood, but there is a neediness there. Uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me. And I want to acknowledge Archbishop Hughes. It's my, it's my pleasure and pride to have you in the audience. So, and for all of the rest of you, I hope it's on. It's on. Yeah. For all of the rest of you, I hope this satisfies some Lenten obligation. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the hundredth anniversary of Rerum Novarum, in his encyclical Centesium Musanus, John Paul II observed. Pope Leo XIII, in the footsteps of his predecessors, created a lasting paradigm for the church. The church, in fact, has something to say about specific human situations, 
both individual and communal, national and international. She formulates a genuine doctrine for these situations, unquote. But then he continues. Leo XIII's approach in publishing Rerum Novarum gave the church citizenship status, so to speak, amid the changing realities of public life. So let's flag two things in those comments. First, he speaks of Leo as formulating a genuine doctrine. And two, that Catholic social doctrine has the distinction of being taken seriously, not only by Catholics, but also by the nations, including the New York Times, which published Rerum Novarum in its entirety. 1891. In a way, the Catholic Church that had been shut out of authoritative public discourse since the French Revolution got its mojo back with Leo XIII, citizenship status. But spin the reel forward, Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, in Caritas and Veritate, observing the anniversary of Pope Paul VI, Pope Alorum Progressio, which was published in 1967. Here's Benedict. Clarity is not served by certain abstract divisions of the church's social doctrine, which apply categories to papal social teaching that are extraneous to it. It is not a case of two typologies of social doctrine, one pre-conciliar, one post-conciliar, differing from one another. On the contrary, there is a single teaching, consistent and at the same time ever new. What was Benedict worried about? Well, I'll give you a hint, it had already happened by the time he issued the warning. Basically, what was called the lasting paradigm, evolving from Leo, and from what I can tell, going pretty solidly through John the 23rd. Uh, there's a, there is a division in Catholic social doctrine, and it means quite a lot. In fact, I'm here this evening to talk to you about uh, yeah, it's really true there are two typologies and that these typologies did not come to pass because of Pope Francis. In fact, they came to pass long before John Paul II or Benedict became Pope. Second, because the, the problem is rooted not chiefly in what we would call the auditus fidei, that is, how we receive or hear the word, it's rooted chiefly in the intellectus fidei. That is, how we appropriate the ratio of the faith, how we understand it. This is the formal object of faith, which is God revealing, but it includes also its philosophical infrastructure. So this evening I'll speak for five or 10 minutes on the older typology, the Leonine typology, and note some of its salient characteristics. Then I'm going to spend perhaps 10 minutes on what I'm gonna call warning signs. Even before the Second Vatican Council, it was noted that Catholic social teaching was spreading itself much too thinly across too many sorts of social problems and that its intellectual coherence was wobbly, becoming more of a praxis than a doctrine. Then I will move to John Paul II's decision for the first time since Leo to formally put Catholic social teaching under moral theology. 
in order to restore the theological and philosophical organization of its principles. As I will tell you, this effort was not entirely successful. And then I will end very briefly by noting how these two typologies, if left unresolved, uh, have cruel consequences for us as Catholics. So, first, the great coherency. A curial document uh, published for the formation of priests, mid-1980s, referred to the Leonine era of social doctrine as the great coherency. Now, as a point of historical fact, before Leo, there was no such thing as doctrina socialis. In previous times, going all the way back to Tridentine times, it was called doctrina civilis. Basically, it consisted of ecclesiastical implications for relations with temporal regimes, concordats, and summaries of definitions and principles taken from scholastic ethics. Aristotle, Aquinas, Suarez, and others. It was consulted and read almost entirely by specialists or by clergy being trained for the diplomatic corps or canon law. If you had been a seminarian in Rome when Leo was elected in 1878, I guarantee you, if you weren't going in the diplomatic corps or canon law, you would have never even heard of doctrine of civilis. Pius XI, 1922 to 1939, was a student of Pope Leo XIII. He was the first pope to speak of social doctrine as a unified body of teachings, which developed by way of clarity and application. That's in Quadragesa Milano. He said that he inherited a doctrine handed on from Leo. Now, Leo is an interesting character. He was born in 1810. By the way, the first pope to be born in the 19th century and the first pope to die in the 20th. He died in 1903. John Paul II is the first pope to be born in the 20th century and the first to die in the 21st. If you put JP2 and Leonine as the book ends, what, you're gonna go from everything from Napoleon to Madonna in this period of time. I mean, the, the, the expanse of history is, is, is enormous. Uh, Leo really did change the game. And although he didn't call it social doctrine, that's left for pious. Uh, his thinking was not chiefly oriented to the problems of governments, although he had plenty to say about political issues. What he addressed was a pervasive social disintegration from the late 18th century through the 19th century. The French Revolution, which spread to almost every country in Europe and to almost all of Europe's uh, colonies, uh, had the slogan liberty, equality, and fraternity. And the key one was fraternity because the French model claimed that the state had a monopoly on fraternity. That is, all social relations other than citizenship were either suppressed or reduced to merely private things. During the revolution, priests and bishops held their offices merely as civil officials. The bishops were elected and appointed by the people, including unbelievers. Uh, priestly celibacy was made a private matter, as was sacramental marriage. Solemn or final religious vows were crimes. They were subject to criminal law. This is why more than 100,000 clergy and nuns had, had to flee France during the revolution. It was a criminal act to take a solemn vow. Uh, congregations of religious and laity devoted to corporal works of mercy education, guilds, all suppressed. And I have this little fact for Father Luke. In 
1789, the year the revolution broke out, there were 25,000 Dominicans worldwide. At the time of Leo's election in 1878, there were 3,300. At the time of the French Revolution, there were 2,500 Benedictine monasteries and abbeys in Europe. By the middle of the 19th century, 30 remained. 30 remained. In fact, they had to flee to Protestant countries, like Salem eventually goes to England. So this notion of the state having a monopoly on fraternity, that is, the social relations other than citizenship are either subversive or merely private matters spread across Europe. Uh, an interesting little uh, scenario. The future Pius VII, Cardinal Chiaramonti, who was the Bishop of Imola in Italy, had put on his stationery liberty, equality, and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ. It was fraternity that was the fighting issue for the Catholics. Liberty and equality, listen, we're in this game longer than the revolution is. But the fraternity was the problem. And it was not just a wreckage throughout Europe, sociologically speaking, right? It was uh, also just industrial revolution and global trade. By the time Leo was elected, every continent on Earth had its interior penetrated by the railroad, creating global markets. Local economies withered. Uh, when Leo was elected pope, within one generation before his becoming pope, uh, half of the German population moved from rural areas to cities. It was disastrous sociologically and economically. We had wage labor, the immiseration of the urban poor. There was such social disintegration in the 19th century, so quickly that the 19th century was the century that gave birth to the social sciences. It wasn't just Catholics who were noticing this. You know, we have Durkheim and Marx and Max Weber and Auguste Comte, one after another. And we did the United States as well. The United States became the place to go for utopian communes. Okay. So, the situation was ripe for a doctrina socialis. And it's right to speak of the coherence, the great coherency of the Leonine era. Because six popes either came of age or were born during Leo's pontificate. Pius X, born in 1835. He was in middle age when Leo was elected. Benedict XV, born in 1854. Pius XI, born 1857. Pius XII, born 1876. He was ordained a priest during the great jubilee of, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, oh, John the 23rd, 1881. Uh, a seminarian in Rome when Leo was getting toward the end of his pontificate. In fact, John the 23rd wrote a fan letter to Leo the 13th saying, good job with Rerum Novarum. <laughs> uh, and Paul VI, 1897. How couldn't there be a great coherency? They all knew each other. Pius XII, as I said, was, was ordained during Leo's pontificate. All of these popes, built upon their predecessor's work. For example, Pius XI takes Leo XIII's encyclical on marriage, Arcanum Divinae, and reprises it as Casti Canubi. He also takes Leo's Rerum Novarum and reprises it as Quadragesimo Anno. I don't believe in the history of our church had there been such a coherence generationally of popes. I guess there's eras in which popes are dying like fleas because of plagues and all kinds of other revolutions going on in Florence or something. 
but I'm talking about a different kind of generational coherence in which they knew each other and were in a way students of one another. And they were educated in philosophy, in Thomism, or what came to be called neo-scholastic thought. They understood moral theology and its philosophical infrastructure. Leo XIII was for 30 plus years bishop of Perugia, and uh, he founded the Perugian Academy of St. Thomas and Aquinas and brought it to Rome in 1878 when he was made the Pope. And it was that team, by the way, housed in the Casina Pio Porto out in the Vatican Gardens, that helped him produce more than 100 encyclicals. By the way, they were not all on social doctrine. But he had a fantastic team. He was also a prisoner in the Vatican, because after 1864, uh, all that was left of the pontifical regime was the Vatican itself. Leo never left him after he became Pope, except for his funeral. He left his first funeral in uh, the uh, uh, letter. Future popes got their graduate degrees in that academy, Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Plus, they had the good sense of not, not going after every kind of social problem. They focused on the three necessary societies. Marriage, family, which they called domestic, polity, and church. And if I had to have an emblem summarizing the Leonine coherency, it would be we are familial animals, political animals, and ecclesial animals. Their encyclicals address the mind. That's why the church got citizenship status. People were flabbergasted that popes reworking medieval philosophy could speak so eloquently not with power, but with intellectual authority. The authority of the intellect. And that's what had been missing in the church beginning during the Enlightenment era. The church was ridiculed by the Enlightenment philosophers. Right? Leo and his successors went a long way to restoring that. But let me give some warning signs. Uh, the first warning sign was during the time the pontificate of Pius XII, who only issued one straightforward social encyclical, Sumi Pontificatus 1939, issued on the Feast of Christ the King after the invasion of Poland. Now, I count Mystici Corpus as his greatest social encyclical, but that's another issue. Uh, but after World War II, he never wrote another social encyclical. You just have, this is really the warning signs. You have to interpret the smoke signals going on here. I mean, he was as smart as any of them, and extraordinarily experienced in the diplomatic war, in law, in philosophy. And these were crucial informative years after World War II. One war had ended, another one, the so-called Cold War, had just begun. There was a vast rebuilding effort in Western Europe, which, in which the Catholic Church played a crucial role of those emergent social democracies. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, it was the beginning of global decolonization. The biggest period of decolonization was basically between 1948 and 1968. I remember, because I was a kid, stamp collecting, and I couldn't keep the same stamp books anymore because every 10 months the flags changed <laughs> at that time. Why, it's sort of like, why the dog didn't bark? Why didn't Pius keep on issuing encyclicals? By the way, he issued all kinds of little things, addresses to Catholic groups, 
he gave addresses. Uh, there is a three volume set just of his little pieces. Why didn't he do the big thing? What kind of, what was restraining him? Well, he thought the problems were too big. And he went small. He gave little talks about industrialization and technology in, in society. He could give little talks, but not some big overarching encyclical. He resisted the temptation to overreach. And his time in the diplomatic corps and his time in the papacy, he learned a lot about that drama. Second warning, a book by two French-speaking Jesuits, Calvé and Perrin, title in English, first in French, The Church and Social Justice, The Social Teachings of Popes from Leo XIII to Pius XII. Published, I think, in 1958. By the way, it's the best book on social teaching since the Second World War. You have it in your library, surely. Uh, and especially the first three chapters on the principles are very finely crafted. Uh, but they worried in this book, and they were quite honest in their apprehensiveness that so many different issues were being addressed by the church, and the problems were so complicated at a material level, especially economic problems, and so relatively little attention is being given to, how to put it, philosophical rehabilitation of the basic principles that Catholic social teaching, and here I am quoting, will become a bundle of social aspirations analogous to so many social systems which may be well-intentioned but which lack precision and strength. Warning sign. The best book out was warning. Anyway. Next warning sign, the council. And of course, uh, John the 23rd summoned the council and his uh, document, Humane Salutis. And it's there he uses the term signs of the times, signa temporum. And what he meant by the signs of the times was Matthew 16. It, it's right in the bull of indiction for the, for the council. Remember what happens. In Matthew 15, uh, Jesus upholds the faith, the Canaanite, Canaanite woman, and he feeds the 400, breaks the bread, divides the fish. Then, in Matthew 16, Jesus and the apostles get in a boat and cross the lake. And Jesus admonishes the apostles that they're able to read every sign. Like, if the sky turns red, it's going to rain the next day. They can read every sign but the sign of Jonah. They cannot read the sign of the Messiah who just divided the bread. In fact, Matthew points out, they forgot to bring bread across the lake. And it's after this admonition that Peter confesses his faith. It's an absolutely crucial uh, uh, part of the scripture that John the 23rd was citing. It was Christological and eschatological. That is, the bishops must come together for a council, and they must understand what the Holy Spirit is teaching. There was nothing immediately sociological about it. In fact, it's the sociological approach that the apostles were being criticized for by Jesus in Matthew 16. Uh, so, by the time of Gaudium and Spes, the eschatological and Christological uh, notion of uh, the signs of the times had been left out. 
by the way, Gaudium and Spes is a very good document. Otherwise, it mentions the issue of truth no less than 38 times. Okay, so Gaudium and Spes was not pitching out all of the philosophical or theological infrastructure. But by the time we get to Paul VI, the signs of the times only had the most remote reminiscence of the end evangelical understanding of Matthew 16. In fact, Paul VI gave an audience once and talked about that. And they were now meant to be signs of the times, signs of what of what better times. Better times. In other words, this warning was they were drifting too far into what I would call sociology or historical prognostication. The next warning sign, Popolorum Progressio, which is the one that gave Benedict the 16th, eventually, the occasion to issue a warning. This was 1967. This was the first encyclical to cite contemporary theological opinion in contemporaneous books and journals. It's also the first in this line of encyclicals that make no citation whatsoever from medieval or Baroque era schoolmen. Zero. There is a reference to Jacques Maritain. Nothing to Aquinas, nothing to Boethius, nothing to Swart, none of it is gone. Uh, and in fact, it looked as though Catholic social doctrine had become simply historically constituted dialogue. Historically constituted dialogue. Unfortunately, a lot of the Catholic history had been left out, but it had to do with actions. It had to do with actions of rebuilding a better society. This is exactly what the two Jesuits, Calvé and Perrin, were worrying about just a little more than 10 years earlier. But Paul had a second thought about this. By the way, Pope Alorium Progressio was not very well received, especially, I see, our, our very old father in uh, the South, because some of the liberation theologians actually made a good point on this. He was dictating so many huge policies, from international banking to aid to whatever, they said, this is just a bunch of Yankee policy coming south, right? Why don't you let us speak about this? And Paul VI was very disappointed. It wasn't more enthusiastically received. And so on the 80th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, uh, he sent an apostolic exhortation to Cardinal Rouat, who was president of the Pontifical Commission for Justice and Peace. And this apostolic exhortation goes under the name of Octogesima Advenians. Quote, Paul VI now, in the face of such widely varying situations, it is difficult for us to utter a unified message and to put forward a solution that has universal validity. Such is not our ambition nor is it our mission. It is up to the Christian communities to analyze with objectivity the situation which is proper to their own country, to shed light on it from the gospel's unalterable words for the social teaching of the church." Unquote. This was a very important document. I could give a whole lecture on optogesing because uh, both the conservatives and the more progressives thought it was great. Just what the doctor called for, uh, maybe for different reasons. Uh, one very, very competent theologian of the era, Sister Mary Osborne, uh, remarked about Octogesima. This approach provides fertile soil for permanent preoccupation not answers, and creative innovations within the social teaching of the church. Peter Hebelweiss, 
the ferment of the gospel is now to be realized in historically constituted dialogue. And it should be done by people on the ground, uh, not from Rome. For his part, Cardinal Rouen, on the anniversary of Pachamanteras, now Pachamanteras is old enough to get an anniversary, the 10th anniversary, sent a letter back to Paul VI. All of this stuff is published, and it's published in English, by the way, uh, wanting to instruct Paul VI on what's worth keeping and what's worth dumping from Pachamanteras. And Cardinal Rua, who is uh, from Quebec, observed that the beginning of Pachamanteras asserts that peace is a diligent observance of divinely established order. And the Cardinal says, this word just jars the modern mentality, as does even more the idea that it summons up, which is a complicated organic scheme or giant genealogical tree in which each being and group has its predetermined place. For Cardinal Rua, the metaphysics of eternal law and those kind of categories doesn't mean they're false, but they shouldn't be used in Catholic social doctrine. We won't be able to dialogue with that kind of terminology. It's insufficient for what we would call today theology of accompaniment. Just open your mouth, you guys will all be pastors, and start talking about the eternal law. And people won't head for the door, but I think that's what Cardinal Raw was trying to say. But it was a very curious letter to write to the Pope. One, because the Pope had issued Humanae Vitae that based the Catholic principle against contraception on natural law. And he was in he was on the hot box because of it. Not to mention the fact that Pachamanteras, which is the document that Cardinal Rua only wanted a little bit of, uh, makes more references to eternal law and natural law than any letter since 1878. So in one fell swoop, Cardinal Rua had managed to dump Pachamanteras and put a certain cloud over Humane Vitae, uh, Paul VI never responded. And exactly at this time, a Dominican comes on the scene. Very sharp Dominican, who sort of understood what was going on, that there really were two typologies. They didn't call it that. Uh, his name was uh, Chenu, and he published a very, one of the most important books that no one knows about. And it's called The Social Doctrine of the Church as Ideology. Why is it ideology? According to Chenu, because it uses the philosophy of Perennis as a way to address the historical phenomena of a changing age. He goes so far as to call Pope Leo's encyclicals outright deism. It's all this natural law stuff. Uh, here's a quotation. Uh, Highest the eleventh's understanding of the church as the guardian of the truth of nature of man and society is theocratic, and that the theologies of liberation emanating from the messianism of the oppressed are never to be built on the files of this sort of social. Now, I say this, you know, Leo, the Leonine tradition in Shenu is saying it's bourgeois ideology. It's legitimating unconscious prejudices. Enter JP2, who read Shenu and moved immediately. If you want to know why JP2 says in every other breath in his, in his social encyclicals, that it's not ideology. It's, he's still trying to answer Shannon. Remember, his first trip, John Paul II's, was not to Poland. Everyone thought he'd go to Poland right away. No, he went to South America. And he 
criticized the liberationist version of the new typology uh, and insisted that Catholic social teaching is under moral theology. He does exactly the same thing in Solicitudo Re Socialis, 1987. It's under moral theology. Again, in Centesi Musamus, it is genuine doctrine, not ideology. It's under moral doctrine. And he goes so far in 1993. This is really a deep preoccupation of John Paul II. You learn how to read his stuff. He keeps on coming back to it. He issues for the first time in the history of pontifical documents an encyclical on moral theology. It's called Veritatis Splendor. No one had done this before. Why is he going after moral theology? Well, he wants social doctrine, which he believes is incipiently a second typology. Put it under moral theology. But whoa, whoa, moral theology is all screwed up now. So he has to issue an encyclical on that. It comes back once again in Evangelium Vitae. And finally, in Fides Orazio, 1998, he makes constant references for the need of the intellectus fidei on social doctrine and criticizes any formation of the clergy which allows mere eclecticism in philosophical training. I mean, eclecticism is the name of the game of the second typology. Uh, finally, in Ecclesia in America 1999, he orders the Council for Justice and Peace. That was Cardinal Roa's council. It would be very useful to have a compendium or approved synthesis of Catholic social doctrine. Such a synthesis would only formulate principles, leaving their application to further treatment of specific issues bound up with different local situations, unquote. So he wants to agree with Paul VI in Octogesium. We shouldn't have this giganticism where we're talking about everything. We should be talking about the principle and let this be happening at a proper level of analysis of changing historical facts. And so, he ordered the creation of the Compendium of Catholic Social Doctrine. It went to justice and peace, uh, lamenting, quote, that this doctrinal patrimony is neither taught nor known sufficiently. Cardinal Renato Raffaele Martino, president of the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, presented the Compendium in 2004. index is almost as long as the compendium. And you know, before that came out, I had no idea that Italians could do the work the Germans used to do. But every <laughs> word in that thing is indexed. So. Uh, but there is no argument. There's no philosophical synthesis. And just as bad, there's no historical narrative. Under the main topical section headings, one could read the paragraphs backwards. There's no factor to it at all. It's a completely flat scheme without even a hint of complication. Uh, principles and uh, definitions are uh, simply put into juxtaposition, side by side. Sometimes, in ways that seem directly contrary to one another, violating the principle of non-contradiction, uh, without any comment or mediation. You'll see that on the principle of the common good. Uh, it's as though the whole thing, since Leo had no synthesis. By the way, there was five times more space given to the Vatican's intervention and the Kyoto Fresh Water Conference than on justice itself. Check it out for yourself. So, but the main problem is that it's a proliferation of principles. So, at the beginning, it says, these are four principles. 
dignity of the human person, principle of the common good, principle of subsidiarity, principle of solidarity. But it doesn't stop. Then it goes into fundamental values, which are presented exactly like principles. And in fact, in section 77 of the compendium, they're identified with principles. There is no discernible difference between what they're going to call values and principles. And in fact, Pope Francis has himself publicly stated so. And it, it's a correct observation about the He relies far too much on it, by the way. But it's a correct observation. So now we go after the principle of solidarity, truth as a value. Well, truth is the formal principle of the intellect, for heaven's sakes. Even Thomas in question 94 of the Prima Secunde says the first law is the principle of non-contradiction. I mean, how can you have principle of the common good subsidiary and solidarity when you've made truth something that must follow upon it? Uh, then freedom, and then justice, notwithstanding the importance of the Kyoto Fresh Water Treaty. The universal destination of goods, which seems pretty important to me, how that's just value, uh, but what, what should be put on there? Preferential option for the poor, participation, and then love, which is the formal principle of the will in social matters. This is kind of a cockeyed scheme. Uh, it's, it's a kettle of fish. And then Francis, for his part, in Evangelii Gaudium, adds four more, right? Time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas. With that crazy footnote that, that uh, realities are more important than ideas, he cites Plato, for heaven's sake. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the whole is greater than the part. Uh, and by the way, if you look at uh, national bishops conferences who put out uh, guidebooks for reading the compendium, this is how bad it's getting, right? The compendium is a guidebook for the catechism. Now we have these guidebooks for the compendium. All of them conflate uh, the principles and the values. And I'm, I'm not sure they're wrong to do so. But what we have here, Cardinal Martino, bless his heart, really did try to follow the Pope's orders, which is we want doctrine. They just kept on proliferating principles as doctrines. Of course, it's counterproductive. 15 items of a set can be combined in how many ways? There's 15 of them. Well, you do the math, it's in the thousands. So suppose you're a seminarian in Rome, or even here at Notre Dame, you're doing an oral exam. And let's say we have, the, your question on the oral exam is, under what principle does the Kyoto Freshwater Treaty fall? And a good beginning would probably say dignity, the very first one. Uh, and then your examiner says, but which of the other 14 would you use to assemble that answer? How would you put it into an ordered set? And if that student responds in this way, I would pass that student in a moment. If the student asked, is this a tricky question, or is it a trick question? Pass that student. Understood perfectly what the mess is here. Without an ordered set, 15 items, a lot of them are completely duplicative of, of other ones. We have a problem. So here's where it comes in. It's the effort to try to reconcile the two typologies, but done in, in a ham-fisted way. Uh, no one could candidly, admit, this is my conclusion, candidly admit that they are relying on principles 
when there are 15 without an order of set. Uh, that collection of principles, if it should move the ascent of the mind, would only move it as Calvé and Perrin worried about in the late 1950s, as bundles of aspirations, social aspirations, as kind of policies that we would like key to historical timeliness, but bound together by cliches. Front-loading of conclusions for action, which make the search for truth OTOs. Now we have a problem that uh, Calvé and Perrin did not have to consider in the 1950s, which is that now social teaching is a 24-7 operation. According to the latest figures, the dicastery for communication in 2021 had a 43 million, uh, excuse me, euro budget, about 20% of the total of the Vatican. Its expenses are greater than the combined expenses of the 10 smallest Vatican departments. With, the, with this budget, the Vatican's communication office accounts for uh, just an enormous uh, chunk of the budget. And it's more than all of the Vatican embassies in the world, budget for all of the Vatican embassies. And so there's a 24-7 flow of news. And all you have to do is look at Fratelli Tutti. The Pope quotes himself 140 times, including <laughs> TED Talks. By the way, Francis did not invent this. That's why I think this was going on before Pope Francis. It's so bundles of social aspirations put together in the way journalists would put them. Uh, second part of the conclusion. This is church dividing stuff. All you have to do is examine the current German Senate to see the case in point. That is, gone are the older social ontologies that are crucial for things like sacraments and ecclesiology. These things are now analyzed as social aspirations that match political parties or governments. Social aspirations for what women should be doing, for uh, whether it's useful or socially up to date to have married or, or uh, celibate clergy. It's, this is social doctrine of a very lazy sort uh, that becomes a substitute for moral theology and ecclesiology. I, I would put it this way. Since Paul VI, we have this problem. Not, to, not to saying he caused it, but it influences all of us. There's Catholic morality that's bad and difficult to defend. That's Humani Vitae. And then there's happy. Catholic morality, and that social justice. We've got a kind of a bad cop morality, and we have a happy one. The happy one is not is, is social doctrine function out of the context for which it was designed. And in this regard, uh, remember what happened to the Protestants in the 19th century. Once they gave up on Matthew 16, but Schleiermacher, they would not defend the real kairos of history, which is, of course, the sign of Jonah. And they didn't know what to do once they had signed my Jesus as the Christ, and they did social gospel. And by the way, they got away with it for three generations. Actually, the Protestant social gospel movement was brilliant. Great thinkers from Rausch and Bush to um, one after another. And then it ran out. By the early 20th century, it ran out. And they didn't even, they, they, they had neither Jesus Christ nor any purchase on, on social teaching. 
they become irrelevant. Some of them claimed, I think it was a kind of a Bolt Bonian thing, that's just where we should be is irrelevant now. We finally closed down the shop. But I think there's a clear and present danger of the second typology of social doctrine just becoming contrary moral theology, and it will be church dividing. And so, my final words. You all know the syllogism of the mad tonist. Uh, syllogism of the mad tonist, first premise, is all wisdom is in the mind of the angelic doctor. Second principle, uh, pre uh, uh, premise, I know the mind of the angelic doctor. Uh, listen, my, my explication of this and criticism of the two typologies is not to say everything has to be principles, definitions, synthetic work. Principles, definitions, and synthetic work will make Jack a dull boy, or maybe just a precocious Platonist. <laughs> or maybe just an idiot savant appropriating Catholic social teacher. You need more than that, of course. Without, this, without prudence in the domain of a changing world, uh, no commands can be given. No commands can be given. And Rua and Shenu were right on this, on, on this account. But everything is not induction and experience either. Without the principles, definitions, and syntheses, there is no intellectus fidei. This was John Paul II's point. There might remain an auditus fidei, but it's unclear who is speaking or listening at that point. Well, this lasting paradigm, for this lasting paradigm, much is at stake. And I leave you with one final thought. So long as the more changeable paradigm or typology is not normed by the Leonine, or something very much like it, as McIntyre would say, something very much like it, the most important issue for Catholic social doctrine is stuck in the mud. That is, the laity are supposed to be the ones entering the historically constituted dialogue with the city and the society. It just hasn't come about, and there's all kinds of reasons, but so long as the Leonine principle governing the intellectus fidei in social thought, until that is the norm of the more changeable one, it does no good to have laity in charge of these kind of judgments. So long as there's a harem scarum of principles, the laity are going to be as bad as the clerics are on it. They'll just have lay opinions about the same historically constituted things. Uh, so we are like, as Plato said, we're like a child crying for both. We want historically constituted dialogue, but we also want universal principles that are not just political or ideological generalizations or cliches that are changed every four months. Yeah, I, I think with that, if I say any more, it would be too much or I'd get into trouble. Perhaps. Thank you. <laughs> So we have some time for some Q&A. We have a microphone here, just make sure that it's on. If you have a question, come to the microphone. Thank you. Here comes Father Luke to be on behalf. Put my feet to the front. Russell, it's good to see you here in New Orleans, as we plan to see each other. I really appreciated 
what you were saying. And that reminded me of the last talk I heard at Berkeley at the GTU Library by Professor um, <coughs> Robert Bella from the Sociology Department down the street. He had a very interesting title. The title of his talk was, What's Wrong with American Protestant Thought? And I thought of that lecture as I was listening to you. And he began his talk saying, this is going to sound very critical. I'm not making a generalization of every Protestant, but I am a Protestant myself of the Episcopal denomination. He said, and for those of you, it's near the end of the semester, need a good nap, I'll tell you the conclusion. What's wrong in some quarters of American Protestant thought? There's no room for Christ. So I was wondering to what extent, as you speak of these two typologies, um, he ended his lecture saying, the Catholic moment has arrived, meaning Roman, said he, and massive quotations from John Paul II showing the interconnection of Trinity, Christology, and creation. So could you summarize what you're saying in terms of putting it together these two different typologies. That's kind of my question, but an invitation for you to say a little more. Well, when the great teachings of the Reformation, Calvinists, Lutheran, and others, when they lost their nerve in the face of the new theology in the 19th century, Schleiermacher and the rest. If you give up our creedal Christianity that requires us to understand Jesus as the Christ, as pre-existent Logos, our Trinitarian thought, just for starters, there's no work for philosophy to do. Or at least not much work for philosophy to do. What challenges our understanding and practice of the intellect is for day really comes from our theology. And it's in the effort to understand that those theological well, revelation that it's urgent. It makes Christian philosophy, philosophical activity, something more than just an ordinary school of thought. It tests it all the way down to its feet. When Protestants, an evidence of which is that when magisterial Protestantism gave up the kairos of the Christ and moved to what we could call social justice, although it was not called that exactly then. That's a little bit later in the 19th century. But uh, they quickly found there was no need for their philosophy. Or for any kind of high-level thinking at the, for the intellectus fidei. Because the, the intellectus fidei wasn't challenged anymore. So they moved to social science. Uh, social science has almost nothing to do on Trinitarian uh, issues. Uh, but that was already abandoned. So they made a bid for uh, late 19th century social science. And then by the time of World War I, it was all passe. And they, they had neither anymore. They neither had their, their great Reformation uh, teachings, Christian teachings, nor did they have how put it, their own version of the, you know, Lutherans had really good philosophers. I mean, Melanchthon was a fairly competent scholastic. They lost both. Uh, what more can I? What more can I say? Uh, and that's why we have found that pattern of things happening when the the things we confess in the creed are kind of sidelined. Maybe they're not denied, but kind of sidelined. What comes in to fill the gap? And 
Well, we bring in what seems important and current. Yeah. And Cardinal Rouault, I guess he was probably a great guy, but, you know, he should have known better. And even Paul VI, as much as Paul VI silence. By the way, Rouault published that thing before Paul VI could even uh, respond, but he didn't respond because to abandon our philosophical philosophical theology and all of this was unthinkable. An unthinkable thing for a pope to say. Sorry about that. Thank you again for the talk. It was very insightful and I appreciate that. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, the impact of these two uh, competing typologies on the usage of the, the notion of human dignity inside the church's ethical, social teachings, etc., and how that's evolved or perhaps become uh, confused over throughout this time frame. Of course, we want to know exactly in what does the dignity consist and the traditional answer for centuries, and it still is our answer, uh, rational animal, that two kinds of perfections are uniquely brought together in the human being, of the changeable and the material and life with a divinely given though created intellectual light. Our dignity is, is in the very composition of that. Um, well, that's how we have to begin, I think. That's what makes us different than angels. And, uh, but it's what makes us one with the incarnate second person of the Trinity. Uh, so, I would begin by examining dignity in terms of in what does it consist. I think for the most part in common discussion and use of this term, it means that which has rights would be the answer, and which, which is not totally wrong, right? But the next question comes to why. And what kind of rights? Are there rights that proceed from its nature that are higher than its nature? So you're not going to be able to avoid, I think, an even somewhat casual conversation, having to get back to the issue of in what does it consist? And for us, it consists by creation of the the rational animal, who was different than all the things created in Genesis 1 up to that point. There's a threshold that's crossed, let's create man in our image, male and female, he created them. That there's, we have the perfection of all movable things, and we have the perfection of animals, and that we have the perfection of a created light. And that's our model. That's our image. And an image has no function other than to turn to its prototype. I mean, it'd be like, what's the function of a mirror without something to be mirrored? An image has in its very operations the vocation of mirroring its prototype. Yep. And we're often and we're often running, and we not even out of Genesis one we are we already have male and female, uh, the first necessary society, and we have the first necessary society is already naturally manifesting 
uh, in imaging the higher divine society, uh, and we're off and running. By the way, I don't think you have to take philosophy or very many theology classes to get off and running with that. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Estel Hittinger, thank you for your presentation tonight. Thank you for your work on social justice. I think this is an area of study that is, uh, to quote a theologian that I was looking at today on the internet, I think yourself, it, it really is a place where we're struggling with a laxity and moral and uh, theological rigor. And uh, it's something that impacts a lot of areas. You mentioned ecclesiology, you mentioned moral theology. I know Father Kelly's just aching to ask a couple of questions on that. But I think it's it significantly impacts the way people go about pastoral ministry, pastoral theology. Uh, back in the 60s, we had the social Catholic workers movement and that just took off. And lots of books were written on how pastoral theology was supposed to be done at that time. And it followed Gaudiwitz Spes and it goes all the way back to Rare Navarro. And there has not been as many books written on good pastoral ministry, ministry of pastoral theology since then. And it still impacts us. I know you're talking about the 60s and 70s, like you know, the Protestant theology has kind of run itself out. But these guys will go out into the world and they're going to be preaching and ministering in a lot of dioceses where they're going to have predominantly Protestant uh, brothers and sisters in their in their area. And they're going to be encountering that that weak theology that you're talking about. It's almost a uh, therapeutic deity. That theology of accompaniment that you mentioned, it's become accompaniment without theology. Uh, a therapeutic kind of theology, if you want to say that. So I want to thank you for your hard work, and I also want to say uh, you've left us no solutions, I noticed. Your paradigm only has bad and worse. Well, because... Uh, thank you, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to give you one more chance. You should invite me back to talk about the about how I would begin explicating <laughs> Thomistic social doctrine. Uh, yes. But then there would be this vampire in the closet and I'm not pointing to it. I, I think in New Orleans on a Friday night, I should address the vampire, <laughs> to be honest. But the problem with social justice, it, it, it's, it's several layers of a problem. The, the Catholic Church never called it social justice uh, until Pius XI, and then he said he would use the term, but only with qualifications. Out of Aristotle, there are three kinds of justice. One is commutative, bilateral exchange, sometimes called private. I give the olive oil distributor so much money for so much olive oil. Uh, then there is the obligation that we as a community owe to our individual members. That's called distributive justice, which is taking divisible things and allocating them to our individual members on the basis of merit or need. So for instance, who should get the medal for bravery in time of war? Well, the brave person, not just anyone who enlisted. Uh, if you're a parent in a family and you have limited resources, who should get the medicine? Well, not the child that saved the money in his piggy bank and wants to buy it from but the sick child should get the medicine. That's called distributive justice. It goes from the commonality to the individual member. Then the last one is called general justice, which is what we as individual members owe the community. It could be anything from taxes to military service, whatever. Here was the problem. The Catholic Church always put common good under that last one. It's something we all share. Right, when, when I serve the country, I'm not any less a person. In fact, I'm enhanced. Whereas distributive justice always takes something and divides it up equitably. By the time we changed our term from general justice to social justice, Virtually the entire educated world meant by social justice, distributive justice, 
which does not have as its immediate end the common good. It has as its immediate end the good of individuals. There's the beginning of the problem. So almost everyone today thinks of social justice as divvying up or re-divvying up divisible things, which is an important moment of justice, by the way. As Aristotle pointed out, it's always the most disputed aspect of justice, right? To, to, to divide things and allocate them on the basis of merit or need, people, people fight over that, right? Human pride itself gets really quickly involved. Unlike commutation, I ah, give you the, the money, you give me the olive oil, we both go away happy not in distributive justice. We're always looking at what the other guy gets. But the point is, is that when social justice comes to me, only distributive justice, the common good has gone missing. This is not just a theoretic problem. I mean, it's, it's a problem on the ground. And uh, so we just keep on dividing it up. If we allocate and reallocate, and the next thing we know, we're reallocating people according to race, right? Or we're reallocating to people according to how important we think they are in the economy. Now, it's, it's a recipe for confusion. And we should have kept, by the way, the catechism does. By the way, footnote to everything I've said. Read the catechism, don't read the compendium. Uh, <laughs> the catechism is pretty good. The problem is it's too big. You, you really do have to piece it all back together again. But it's very clear that they mean by social justice, common good justice, which are the obligation of us as a member of a society for the common good. It is not divisible. It's not a divisible thing. It's a serious problem. And I think, uh, well, Cardinal Schoenberg got the catechism right on this. I was amazed. It's very clear in the catechism. Social justice is not distributive justice. But that puts us at odds with all common use of the term today. Stop me in thanking our speaker for this evening. Just a quick uh, reminder: tomorrow morning at 9:30 in the bib, we have a.